The ancient Nabataean city of Petra was a crucial crossroads of trade in the present-day country of Jordan. The ancient world pushed ideas and empires across cultures. There were no boundaries to where innovation might go. Religion, science, poetry, food, and medicine were shared from family to family, from culture to culture, and from local visionaries to the world. This is the civilizational DNA that Dr. Ziad Hijazi was born of. Today, the torch of tradition in innovation, in culture, and in science is being carried forward by Dr. Hijazi. So this is the entrance for the place where I was born. And you know, I was not born in a hospital. I was born here. No electricity. When I was about six years of age, you know, our means at that time was very, very limited. And you can even see the shoes had a tear in it because we did not have really the money to, uh, to buy any brand new thing. Everything was second hand or third hand. When I was four years of age, I used to play doctor. So I used to come to my mom and put something on her chest here. Do you hurt? Do you have any pain here? Do you have any pain here? <laughs> أخاف منه أقول شو بتسوي يا زياد ليش شو بتسوي يا مسم الله عليك شو بتسوي بقول لي أنا بكتب في الهواء. We only had one bedroom and one living room. So when the when a, when people come as guests, there was no place for me to study. So either I go in the toilet to sit there and study, or go walk in the boonies, sit underneath a tree and study, study, study until I finish what I want, and then come back. Since my dad always was traveling and working very hard. But Ziad was with us, always with us, and he gave me a homework. Tomorrow you have to finish this. Study, 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 not play. When he was uh, 15 years old uh, at school, the uh, French Cultural Center introduced a course in French language. I studied French and I scored the top student in the French language. He got first on all the other students. So the French government sent me to France for three months. That was a breakthrough for, for Ziad. When Ziad returned from France, he began his medical studies in earnest. So when I went to medical school here, I had a scholarship from the army. And for each year, they pay for your expenses. You have to serve for four years. So six years, that means I had to serve for 24 years. This is my photo as a first lieutenant in the Royal Medical Services, and the certificate was given to me to be able to practice medicine. The first six months we spent in the Jordanian desert, and you are a doctor for the troops there, for the soldiers. During Ziad's medical studies, he was also sent to the United States to serve as a camp counselor. When we were in medical school, we traveled to the U.S. to work as camp counselor for American kids. He was sent uh, to the United States for uh, camping for three months. We 
we started in LA, finished in New York City, and they'll get to learn about our culture, we'll get to learn about their culture. Taking care of kids 10 to 11 to 12. And after that, one month traveling all Travel. over the state. That was the best. We did uh, two trips to the States, uh, and uh, in one of those trips when we were coming back from the U.S., we had to make a stop in Paris, and uh, we actually were broke. We had not a single penny, and we couldn't afford to go buy food. So we had to sit by the counter and wait for the bartender to turn around. We would steal one cross sole and give it to the guy behind. So we had a pretty de decent breakfast. Uh, it was a funny thing, but it, it registered something important in my life, that not everybody in this world is rich. Uh, some people are rich, some people are poor, and you have to feel for the poor and uh, work to make their uh, survive, survival better. Dr. Hijazi's experiences at university and abroad fueled his desire to become a global citizen. After he completed his study, of course, in Jordan, he went to America to get his further education. It's not easy to leave the family behind and go there alone. So I left Jordan in 1984, uh, initially to do an MPH, Master's in Public Health. I did my training at Yale University Medical Center in New Haven, Connecticut, and I was fortunate that one of the pioneers in the field, Bill Hillenbrand, was there. Bill was involved in novel technology which were not available at all anywhere else in the United States. My role at Yale was director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, doing diagnostic and innovative procedures. He worked with me a great deal. And since I saw so much potential in him, I drove him pretty hard. The reason I did that for him is I really wanted him to be the best he could be. So I started to develop and invent either balloons or stents or techniques that I could refine to help patients with congenital heart disease. This at Ziad was one of a handful of doctors in the world who achieved these results. Everything that he did since then was success. <laughs> Despite Dr. Hijazi's success at Yale, he still had a serious commitment to the Jordanian army. He was uh, committed to the army here in Jordan, but there was some problems. I went in 84 to Yale through a scholarship from the army, and the condition was I had to go back after the two years. But after the two years, I wrote a letter to the army to extend my scholarship. The response came, come back to the country immediately. He decided that uh, to stay a bit longer and uh, to refuse to come back to Jordan. That's when I was really low, depressed. My passport is near expiration. What am I gonna do? I did not have a green card, nothing. So finally, I contacted His Majesty through his secretary. I wrote him a letter, and immediately His Majesty, being smart, issued a decree to forgive me and welcome me back to Jordan. During this time, Ziad and his wife, Marie, celebrated the birth of their son, Tarek. Well, we've always prided ourselves on our capital not being under the ground. I mean, we're not an oil-producing country. Our capital is above the ground. The resources of Jordan are uh, its people. Jordanians have gone all over the world and put their excellent efforts to be pioneers. Uh, science diplomacy is the way to go. I made sure that at least once or twice a year, I had to go back to Jordan to hold workshops so that I can teach my fellow colleagues the tricks of the trade. And in turn, these physicians themselves, they traveled to the neighboring countries and also they held workshops to teach other physicians. So I believe that what I was able to do is not just directly impact the physicians in Jordan, but beyond the region, beyond Jordan. Going to needy places to find people who need treatment or who need sponsorship, who need education, charity work in collaboration with the UN. In Haiti, 
in Ivory Coast, in Sudan also. Ziad and I shared one visit to Iraq, and we did like 50 cases there. At this level of uh, competence that Ziad has been recognized as uh, someone who's uh, saved the lives of many, he's a soldier, a bridge builder, a mentor for future Jordanians who can possibly follow in his footsteps, because he's bridging between East and West. Doctor, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> love what I do, I can't be good at it. To follow your heart, it means follow your passion. If you love something, go for it. When he got married, uh, he met an, uh, an Irish uh, girl who is his wife right now. When I met my wife, I followed my heart. I got married twice, one in Jordan, one in Ireland in the church. So the Jordanian wedding, they built a big tent that accommodates at least 1,000, 2,000 people. We took a spin in Amman with beep beep, all the cars, the horns, and everything. And was, here comes this parade of people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was pretty, pretty different. The women will take care of from me and go up to the house inside so that they can sing and dance with no men. So we all went upstairs in the, in the house and we exchanged the rings. We spent about an hour dancing, singing, my mom and my sisters and my brothers, all of them. And then at the end, my dad comes and says, okay, guys, give them rest now. They need to go and relax. Did yeah. you guys think that you were going to do two weddings from the beginning? Or yes. Did... yes. Oh, absolutely. Because my family would not accept me married unless, unless was... I was married in the Catholic Church. The uh, Catholic Church in Ireland uh, agreed to uh, hold a Muslim guy's wedding in the Catholic Church. So this is kind of, you know, a huge right. thing. We all, you know, think the heart is the center of everything, love, affection. You know, people joke always, let me see what is inside your heart, who is inside your heart. Anybody that is born with a cardiac defect, that's under my domain. We fix these defects without open heart surgery. The recovery time is much shorter. Uh, the procedures um, overall are a lot safer. You don't have to crack the chest open. It's traumatizing. I mean, I mean, just the mental thought of going in and then breaking your ribs open and doing a full-blown procedure. You do it through a minimally invasive procedure, usually from the groin or from the neck. There is less trauma to the body, so the healing time is much quicker. I didn't need that scarring in my head and the scarring on my body where every time I look in the mirror and I go, oh my God. Oftentimes, the patient can go home within 24 hours or sometimes even the same day procedure. There is no scar, there is no marks, there's no nothing. So my confidence and my A game is still there. I think the uh, relationship between surgery and any creative process uh, is very clear. You need to have a vision of where you want to go. Oftentimes, when I have a difficult procedure the next day, it keeps me up a long portion of the night thinking, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? He'll probably stay up nights, days, and weeks and research and animal studies and clinicals and do whatever it takes to make that word impossible not because there's about 134 congenital cardiac defects. They come in different shapes and forms and everything. And when you are doing the operation, oftentimes you encounter some difficulties that you did not encounter before. I have a great team of people behind me working with me. Our team, we know each other. We work together more than 10 years. It kind of runs like a like a well-oiled machine. You know what the next step is going to be. I know what he's thinking. Dr. Chow knows which the next view he's going to need in the echo. We can see the inside of the heart, the blood moving, and we can see the valve, the wire in the heart, and the catheter in the heart where it is, and uh, give uh, Dr. Tajade what the kind of view he wants to see exactly real time. 
You have to be smart. I don't want to say genius, but you have to be really good at what you are doing and think out of the box. With his passion for novel technologies, Dr. Ajazi created a forum for sharing his expertise on the international stage. The goal and the vision of the PIX Foundation is to enhance education of healthcare professionals into congenital heart disease. We want to spread the technology. You know, he has a vision in relation to where he thinks the specialty should be, and sometimes I feel he's almost dragging us all with him because of his vision that he has and the energy that he has to try and get there. He teaches so well, and he's so willing to teach people and empower them with the knowledge so that they can do the same types of treatment for their patients. So we did the first meeting, September 1997, in Boston. We think we had 80 people totally attend the meeting. That was the first time we had really done live cases to a meeting for congenital heart disease. It was bold, it was uh, innovative, uh, it was risky. Now we have about between 800 to 1,000 attendees, and the meeting is the meeting in our field to attend. And it attracts amazing interventional cardiologists from all over the world. 50% of the attendees of PICS are from outside the U.S., from 65 different countries. We started a 5K that we do every year, and all that money goes towards a cardiac mission and to help countries that don't have the means to provide patient care. You are a cardiologist in Bangladesh. So you come to the meeting and you see the skills, the technology, the people, so that you can go back to your home country and apply what you have learned at PICS. I mean, the goal is to have less children need open heart surgery and that children all over the US and the world can benefit from these interventional technologies that we're teaching here at PICS. It's uh, four and a half days of intensive scientific sessions, didactic lectures, as well as live operations. Now you can put a webcam up and you can be in that operating room even though you're thousands and thousands of miles away. We do live operations from at least nine cardiac centers around the globe, sites in North America, sites in South America, Europe, and Asia and even in the Middle East. And recently, we've actually done live cases transmitted from Cedars to the conference. And when we do these cases, I've been a participant, they have this great panel in the conference which actually tell us what to do. Well, the advent of the internet has allowed for extraordinary information exchange. Oh, it's a great exchange of ideas. It's been a tremendous uptick in the ability for new technology and techniques to be disseminated and use safely. So he's actually revolutionized teaching all around the world simply through this conference as well as through the internet. Dr. Hijazi's vision for advanced medicine attracted the attention of another forward-looking culture. Doha is a lovely town. It's a cosmopolitan city. Qatar is a unique country where they're building the entire infrastructure. They want to have the best of the best, no matter what is the cost. Qatar is a good place uh, for this uh, center because of the vision, which uh, always comes with providing the best uh, environment for teaching and research. They have a lot of money to support research. This is a music to any scientist ears. The hospital will be modeled on the North American style of practicing medicine. While Cornell Medical College is our medical school and Sidra is the primary teaching hospital for that medical school. So these are the reasons why I chose Qatar because of these three pillars, clinical care, education, and research. The new technology is you know, coming out in the world. We should do always the best, the newest things. So like uh, we develop a new pulmonic valve and we will bring this new valve to Qatar. When I moved from Chicago to Doha, one of the requests I had, I wanted to have the ability to move some of my team members with me. That sociability, collegiality, humanity that physicians express for each other improves the teamwork and often very significantly improves the outcomes because modern medical diseases are treated quite commonly by multiple physicians with unique talents. Now, it's not just the surgeon and not just the cardiologist, it's the engineer, it's the physiologist, the structural people. It's a team effort. Of course, there is a captain. I am the captain. 
But the captain needs the players, smart players. When Hijazi comes and asks you, I would love you to come and work with me, they did not think it wise. They said yes right away, and they are here with me. And that's important. And he talked to me, chilling. We need to move again. I say, OK, tell me when. I'm not asking you where. I want to make this place the hub. I want every mom and dad, if they wake up in the morning and their loved one has a major condition, the first thing that they ought to think of, let's go to Sidra. Children are the innocent people. Not one single illness is their fault. And the reward you get dealing with children, when you cure somebody, you give them a lifespan of 50, 60, 70 years. Every physician uh, is trying to build good relationship with his patient. But Dr. Ziad is superb, dealing with the heart and always dealing with the kids who have very complicated congenital heart disease between life and death. The personal engagement of physicians and the human support that we give patients and families is unquestionably a major motivator for them to get well and want to get well. So there's a spiritual aspect of medicine which is beyond just the scientific things that we do. The way we interact with each other and the way we interact with our patients and their families is really key. Ziyad Ijazi is an example of that. Ziyad Ijazi takes care of children, takes care of families with ailing children. And there has to be an amazing degree of compassion and kindness. Whenever you're treating your patient, look at him either he is your father, he's your mother, he's your sister, he's your son. Relate to patients and their families as if they are your own families. Feel what these families feel. Be one of them. Have the treatment is how kind and how nice you are to these patients. And when you have hope and kindness, the families often just are so happy. I think, again, that's where Ziad has a lovely mix. You know, he has that academic, analytical mind. He has the drive to be able to execute and, and get results in relation to how he delivers care. But, you know, his patients adore him. The reward you get from the patient, of course, and the families is immense. To see the kid growing year after year, you are their hero. This is what I get doing my job. Nothing is better than when you do an operation and the outcome is great.